Resnick's uh, PhD dissertation defense. It's a great pleasure to be here at uh, this time. Um, I want to say a few things uh, about Ed. Um, so when he joined the lab, he came to me and uh, expressed interest in, wor in working uh, with us. And on one line on, on his CV, read, um, he wrote a paper on exact solution of Einstein's equations. And I, this is a no-brainer for me, and uh, I, I actually happen to have a passion for gravitation and, and relativity, but I don't understand in depth. But um, I was kind of uh, a little bit uh, blinded by this, and, and uh, even if Ed mentioned uh, that he wasn't really necessarily keen on digging into the details of biology, but I said to myself, you know, this is going to work out. He'll he'll learn, and we hope he'll uh, appreciate the details. And in fact. Uh, I was right. You know, very soon after, um, the next thing I know, he was uh, digging into complex data sets of gene expression for multiple uh, species of bacteria, and even spending time in the lab pipetting proteins and designing an experiment for testing his own predictions. Um, but at the same time, I, I also I think uh, this was there is a deeper truth in the fact that he was really after the basic principles of biological organization and. If I look in inside at, at his uh, uh, work throughout these years, it's really it's, uh, the common denominator has really been uh, trying to dig out of the details of biology, fundamental principles, uh, aimed at understanding really how biological systems work, uh, what are the basic uh, laws that govern biological organization. Um, and so, basically, out of his own hard work and uh, creativity, and has produced are three papers, and there are five more that are either uh, submitted or at the latest stages of preparation. And and, uh, and his wonderful work has, has been a path through these different levels of organization, uh, ranging from individual reactions, enzymes, uh, to whole metabolism of, of uh, microbes, uh, with impact on multiple fields, uh, dynamical system theory and uh, uh, microbial uh, metabolism, even the math of stubborn roots, and don't ask me as him what stubborn roots are. Um, as interdisciplinary mind has gained him a trip to uh, New Mexico. He was uh, one of participant in the prestigious Santa Fe Institute uh, uh, Complex System, System Summer School. Um, his work has been broad uh, visibility. He was invited to talk at a number of conferences, uh, including the Key conference on uh, metabolic modeling, where he won a prize for best student presentation, and he was recently invited to give a talk at a uh, Harvard organized cell circuits computation symposium on physics and biology. Uh, I want to last mention a few other things about Ed. First, he's very cool, as many of you know. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know how many times you've encountered someone that could tell you about a Jacobian law. Well, uh, balancing and spinning a frisbee on his finger, um, and and he's uh, also I think he liked the challenges. He dives straight into challenges, and if I could give him advice to his uh, future advisors, I would say well, if you want him to work on a problem, just tell him that, that it's impossible. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the last thing I really want to uh, thank him for being such a wonderful member of our lab, very collaborative, and always fun to be to have around. And without further ado, I'll let him. Whiteboard. <laughs> um, thanks for the, the kind words, Daniel. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming. So um, today, I want to tell you about uh, one project which I've been working on for the last year, um, and it has to do with the dynamics of metabolic regulation. And the reason I want to tell you about this project is because I think it's the one that I thought the, the deepest about, and it's the one that I've learned the most about. Um, and in a lot of ways, it provides the most compelling results of anything I've done. And it's probably also the most controversial thing I've done. So um, I think you'll see why. And I hope that as a result, maybe you'll come away uh, having learned a few things or at least having generated a few questions. So um, the project I want to tell you about is basically a steady state regulation free model of metabolism. So hopefully you notice the contrast between a uh, project with 
deals with the dynamics of metabolic regulation in a steady state regulation free model. Uh, they're quite different, but what I'm going to try and convince you of is actually that by studying this, you can learn actually quite a bit about this. So I have to motivate things a little bit. So I want to tell you what metabolism is. Um, and the way I think you should think about metabolism is it's basically the, the collection of biochemical reactions which take place in your cells, and they take high energy environmental nutrients and they transduce them into usable forms that cells can use to grow and reproduce. So you basically take nutrients from the environment, you convert them into things that you can use. So I want to draw you a very accurate picture of how I think about metabolism. It takes place in an ellipsoidal cell and you have nutrients which are these black circles which sit on the outside of the cell and they're imported into the cell by transporters and then these nutrients are metabolized by enzyme-catalyzed biochemical reactions. Now, the key thing about all of this is that I think the way you should think about metabolism is basically in the context of a network. So in this network, you have nodes and edges. And the nodes are these metabolites. <coughs> and the edges are <coughs> the enzyme-catalyzed reactions which convert these metabolites between each other. And by the way, I, I should mention now before I forget that because this is a chalk talk, um, I encourage you to interrupt me when I happen to skip over things. Um, and if you kind of get lost, then you can kind of look at this flow chart that I've given you to kind of figure out where you are. Okay, so. You have this network of metabolic reactions where the nodes are metabolites and the edges are reactions. Um, and I want to tell you what we know about it. So I'm going to introduce some nomenclature which I've developed myself uh, to describe what we know about metabolic networks. So I think that the things we know fall into two broad categories. One is the things that we know a lot about. And the other category is the things that we know a little about. So the things that we know a lot about are basically a structure, or you can think of it as a topology of these networks. So in other words, we know which enzymes are present or absent in these networks. And the reason that we know this is basically it's a direct result of the genomics revolution. So at this point, in an almost automated manner, you can sequence a genome, figure out which enzyme coding genes are in that genome, and reconstruct this network. And there are many, many sequenced genomes, and actually essentially at this point you can give me a genome and I can pump it through something called the seed and then I can give you this. So the things that we know a little about, or very little about, are the dynamics which take place on this network. So remember I told you that the edges on the network are enzyme-catalyzed reactions, right? So these reactions are basically dynamical processes. They take place at certain characteristic rates and we know very little about the particular rates that these processes take place on. So part of the reason is that it's very hard to measure these rates. It's very hard to measure even a metabolite concentration, but it's especially <coughs> hard to measure a rate. And the, the sparse knowledge that we have about these rates basically is the result of about a century of biochemical research. So the biochemists who have been pouring into understanding enzymes over the last hundred years have accumulated some kinetic data on how fast these enzymes catalyze these reactions. <laughs> it's far from an incomplete, uh, sorry, it's far from a complete uh, knowledge base. And so, in fact, if you want to model the dynamics on this metabolic network, you cannot do it simply by writing a system of ordinary differential equations because you don't know the rate constants that kind of determine the rates of these differential equations. So, now you kind of see why this question is interesting. If you want to understand dynamics on this network, you have to deal with the fact that you know the scaffold of reactions that constitutes this network, but you know very little about the detailed dynamics. So how do you model dynamics on such a network? So I'm not the first one to think about this problem. In fact, people have been thinking about it for over 20 years, and probably the, the <coughs> archetypal way to model dynamics on such a network is something called flux balance analysis, or FBA. So 
there's a whole body of knowledge or a whole field kind of devoted to FBA. And this whole talk is somehow going to be about FBA. So I want to give you a lot of intuition for what FBA is. So the way Daniel describes FBA and the way I think about FBA is that it's basically a huge resource allocation problem. You have a cell sitting in some defined medium. It has a limited set of nutrients in the medium. And FBA tries to understand how the cell should import those nutrients and distribute them through its metabolism in order to optimize something. For example, how to optimize how quickly it grows. So it's kind of like the cell is a factory and you're trying to figure out how you should pump the inputs through the factory in order to maximize some output. So the way FBA works is that you're basically given a few things. You're given a metabolic network, so the scaffold that I was telling you about before. And you're given some defined medium. And you try to understand how to distribute the nutrients through that medium, through your metabolism, in order to maximize something. In order to maximize some linear combination of flows on that network. And usually that linear combination of flows corresponds to something biologically meaningful, like the growth rate. So, okay, how does FDA do this? So, there's a key assumption that you make when you do FBA, and it's basically the steady state assumption. And this is what endows FBA with its name plus balance analysis. So I want to tell you about the steady state assumption. So the issue is that you have this network, and you want to understand how to maximize flow along it, but you need some constraints, right? So the constraints that you have are basically twofold. You have two kinds of constraints. One of them is basically the, the medium which your cell is growing in. So you want to know which nutrients are in it. And the other constraint that you have, which is exactly the same state assumption, is that you impose that the flow into a metabolite is stoichiometrically balanced by the flow out of that metabolite. So you basically assume that each metabolite is at steady state. Now, this is a hugely <coughs> controversial assumption. In fact, if you are an FBA person sitting at a conference and you talk to somebody who's not an FBA person, they will probably tell you that they don't believe in what FBA, kind of the results of FBA because the steady state assumption is not really valid. Even in the most ideal conditions where you have cells growing in exponential phase and a chemostat at steady state and you take a population average, it's still likely that you have some metabolites which are accumulating or depleting. So how, how is it possible that if you make this assumption that FBA still works, that the results are still meaningful and accurate? So this is kind of going to be the topic of the talk. But before I get into it, I need to formulate specifically what the FBA problem is. So, okay, if you have these constraints, you can basically formulate a linear optimization problem on this network. So that the typical FBA problem, it looks like this. So you maximize some linear combination of fluxes V. So V is a vector of fluxes. And typically, this linear combination corresponds to basically, um, a, a, it's, it's basically a pseudo reaction that mimics the inputs you would expect to be needed in order for the cell to produce biomass. So typically, this is one flux, and it's called the biomass flux. Okay. So this is what you're trying to maximize, and you have two constraints that, that basically constrain the, the feasible space of solutions for this optimization problem. And one is the steady state constraints. So this, this matrix S is called a stoichiometric matrix, and it encodes the structure of your metabolic network. And if you assume this, this is a, a very shorthand way of encoding the idea that every metabolite needs to be at equilibrium. And you also have constraints which tell you about the medium that you're sitting in. So what is how much glucose do you have access to, how much other stuff do you have access to. So this is the FBA problem. You have know, thoughts that so before I kind of tell you about what I'm going to do, I want to convince you that actually FBA works pretty well. So it's been around for a while, and 
people have compared its predictions to experimental data, and depending on how you do it, it turns out that FBA actually does <coughs> relatively good predictions. So if you want to figure out the growth yield of a cell on a particular uh, medium, actually FBA does pretty well at predicting that growth yield, for example. But nevertheless, despite the kind of successes that we've had with FBA, people always complain about the steady state assumption. So kind of the question I want to address is how sensitive is FBA to the steady state assumption? Now, you would think that someone would ask this question, this FBA has been around for a long time. Actually, no one, no one asked this question. No one has asked this question up until me. I rolled up and I did it. Uh, <laughs> and, and, so, I want to tell you how I did it, and then I want to show you why it's so cool. So the way I did it is by using a concept called shadow prices. And I'm going to give you a lot of intuition for what a shadow price is. Um, and then I want to convince you that these, these shadow prices actually give you a lot of insight into metabolic dynamics. So actually, there's one thing which I forgot to mention, which is really important. I want to just go back to it really quickly for a second, which is that the magic of FBA is that when you assume that metabolites are at steady state, you obviate the need to know anything about their concentrations or their dynamics. So by assuming that metabolites are at steady state, you no longer need to know about the kinetic details on this network. Because you just assume that all the nodes are at steady state. And so this just allows you to kind of qualitatively, or not qualitatively, quantitatively predict the flows on each edge of the network without knowing anything about the detailed rate laws that are kind of controlling those flows. Okay. So this is the question I'm going to address. I'm going to address it with shadow prices, and then I'm going to show you why shadow prices are so cool. So okay, what is a shadow price? I want to give you some intuition for it. So I want to give you some background actually first. So I'm going to abbreviate shadow prices as SP. Um, okay, so what is a shadow price? Well, similar in, in an analogy to um, the fact that there is one element of this vector V for every edge on the network, for every reaction, there's one shadow price per metabolite. Okay? And um, these shadow prices are automatically calculated when you solve an FBA problem. Okay? So, FBA problems are solved using open source, proprietary, whatever you want, optimization solvers. They're solved very quickly. And when you solve an FBA problem, you get shadow prices calculated automatically. So they are, there's no additional computational cost. And the key thing about them, the definition of a shadow price, is it's basically the change in your objective function. It's a change in your objective function as you change the right-hand side of the constraint. And I'm going to kind of elaborate on this a lot, so don't worry if you don't get it. <coughs> so, to give you some more intuition, I want to give you a theoretical interpretation of what a shadow price is. And then I want to give you kind of a more graphical interpretation. So the theory goes something like this. Imagine you have your typical FBA problem. So you have maximize C prime V subject to SV equals zero and these constraints. So, and remember these are vectors, by the way. I haven't been drawing them that way, but they are. So the thing about this is that FBA is a constrained optimization problem. So how do you solve constrained optimization problems? Well, you unconstrain them, right? And the way that you do this, if you take an optimization, is you write a Lagrangian, and the Lagrangian introduces some new variables, which are called Lagrange multipliers, into the problem. So there's two sets of Lagrange multipliers here. One is for each set of constraints, but I'll, I'll just only draw, only write the ones corresponding to the steady state constraints. But these lambdas are Lagrange multipliers, and they quantify, there's one Lagrange multiplier for each constraint, and they quantify how sensitive your optimal solution is to each constraint. 
And the thing is, now this, this Lagrangian, is an unconstrained optimization problem, and you can solve it using standard unconstrained optimization methods. So if you think about Lagrange multipliers a lot, shadow prices are exactly the Lagrange multipliers of the steady state assumptions at FDA. Okay, so that probably means something to very few of you. So I want to give you, I want to give you a much better, I think, interpretation for what shadow prices are. This is a graphical interpretation. So, okay, I want to consider a really simple FBA problem, like the simplest one you can imagine, which is you have a reaction V1, it makes a metabolite M, and then that metabolite is consumed by reaction V2. So, imagine that we want to pump flux through V2, we want to maximize V2, so how do we do it? Well, FBA problem is you just maximize V2, and your constraints are that V1 minus V2 has to equal something which I'm going to call B, which is zero. So if this flow equals that flow, then this metabolite is at steady state. And we can just kind of generically say that V1 has to be less than some maximum, and V2 also has to be less than some maximum. Okay. So this is your FBA problem, and what I want to do is, actually I'll do it right here. I want to draw the feasible space of solutions for you. So you have this two-dimensional space, V1 and V2. And I'm just kind of generically going to assume that V1 max is less than V2 max, but the argument doesn't change if you flip it around. So imagine this is V1 max and V2 max. Okay, so your solutions have to lie inside of this rectangle, and in fact, they have to lie in the line which radiates out at 45 degrees from the origin, which corresponds to V1 minus V2 equals zero. So your feasible space of solutions lies on this line, which I'm erasing by writing on it somehow. <laughs> and um, in fact, the optimal solution is this dot which sits at the top because that's the maximal value of V2. Okay, so actually the optimal solution is that V2 equals V1 max. So, what I told you is that shadow price is the change in the objective function as you change the right-hand side of the constraint. So, in this case, it would be what is the change in the optimal V2, V2 star, as you change V. And V, again, is basically how quickly M is accumulating or depleting. So, imagine I let M deplete a little bit so that V is equal to minus 1. Then, the feasible space of solutions moves to the right, basically moves to this line, this dotted line, and the optimal solution also moves to the right. And in fact, it moves to the right exactly by one, right? So the shadow price is the change in the objective, which is one, divided by the change in the right-hand side of the constraint, which is minus one, so the shadow price is minus one. So, hopefully you get the intuition that a shadow price kind of tells you how sensitive uh, the optimal solution is to changes in the constraints. So, okay, so what? Hopefully you're asking yourself, so what? <laughs> um, so I want to I wanna just write a few more things about shadow prices before I tell you so what. So generically, in, in a metabolic network, if the shadow price is zero, this implies that a metabolite is limiting for whatever the objective is. And in this talk, it's always going to be growth, the biomass flux, okay? And if the shadow price is greater than or equal to zero, and it's almost never positive, it's almost always zero or negative, I won't really tell you why, it doesn't matter, then the metabolite is not limiting. Okay. So, what? Well, So, I'm going to make a claim now, and the claim is that shadow prices actually quantitatively measure how growth limiting a metabolite is. So, my claim, which I'll write in shorthand, is that shadow prices imply growth limitation. Okay, so first I want to tell you what I mean by growth limitation. And then I'm going to tell you how I'm going to support my claim. So you should think about growth limitation. If a metabolite is growth limiting, that means that 
the growth rate is sensitive to the abundance of a metabolite. So if you give a cell a little bit more of an intracellular metabolite, will that increase its growth rate or not? And if it does increase its growth rate, then it's growth limiting. If it doesn't, then it's not. That's what I mean by growth limitation. So I claim that shadow prices give you a quantitative measure of how growth limiting your metabolism is. Well, hopefully, you'll say to yourself, no way. There's no way you can convince me unless he shows me data. So I'm going to tell you about some data. And this data comes from really a beautiful paper by Bohr et al. It's from 2009. It's from David Botsky's group at Princeton. Okay. So David Botsky works on yeast. If you didn't know that, among other things, but he works a lot with yeast. And so he decided to do a great experiment with yeast in a chemo stat. So he grows yeast in a chemo stat. And a chemo stat is basically this, this machine that allows you to culture cells so that they grow at steady state by controlling the, the outflow of nutrients and the inflow of nutrients. So you grow yeast in a hemostat under one kind of nutrient limitation. So under one particular nutrient limitation. So what I mean by this is that the media has a lot of everything but one thing. So it might be, the yeast might be starved for carbon or nitrogen or something. So you do this, and you get the cells growing in the chemostat, and then you take an aliquot and you smash up the cells, and you measure the intracellular concentration of 50 metabolites in those cells. So you measure the concentration of 50 metabolites for a particular growth rate under one kind of nutrient limitation for one growth rate. And then what you do is you repeat this experiment for many growth rates, but under the same time nutrient limitation. So the great thing about a chemostat is that if you pump up the dilution rate in a chemostat, you force the cells to grow faster. So, so, so you, you basically can repeat this experiment for many growth rates, and what you get is for each metabolite a plot and hopefully you guys can see this, where you plot the concentration of an interest on the metabolite <coughs> versus the growth rate. So this can be like pyruvate versus growth rate and carbon limitation. And what you might find is that actually pyruvate grows up as the growth rate goes up. And sometimes you actually might find that uh, you know, uh, glutamine does not go up in carbon limitation. And in fact, you can repeat this for many different kinds of nutrient limitation. So he did it for five. He did it for phosphate limitation, nitrogen limitation, carbon limitation, and then two osotropes. And what he found is that, well, he found this very beautiful thing. He found that in certain conditions, a very well-defined group of metabolites goes up with growth rate. And he calls those metabolites which go up as the growth rate goes up, growth-limiting metabolites. And there's a very good reason why he calls them growth limiting metabolites, and it's because of the Minogue model. So if you haven't heard of the Minogue model, you should. It's, it's basically a very simple model which describes how microbes grow. So the model says that the growth rate of a metabolite mu is basically a saturating function of the concentration of a growth limiting metabolite. So if you plot this function, mu versus m, you find that mu goes up as m goes up, but it, it saturates. Now, what the model is telling you is that if you keep the abundances of all enzymes the same, the only way to pump up your growth rate is to increase the abundance of a growth-limiting metabolite inside the cell or outside of the cell. Typically, actually, this model is applied to extracellular metabolites, but equally applicable for intracellular metabolites. So you can see why David Botstein's group thought that these metabolites which go up with growth rate might correspond to growth limiting metabolites. So if a metabolite goes up, you expect it to actually be influencing the growth rate, and that's why the growth rate is going up. So you have all this data, or I have all this data, because it's just easily downloadable, and 
it's very easy to replicate this experiment in silico in FBA. It's absolutely straightforward. So I just get the yeast model, I get the environmental conditions, and I just calculate the shadow prices from this model. And what I expect is that shadow prices, which are negative, I expect them to correspond to growth limiting metabolites. And shadow <coughs> prices, which are zero, there are no positive shadow prices, correspond to non growth limiting metabolites. And more specifically, I expect that the more negative a shadow price is, the more growth limiting metabolite is. So now, I'm going to do something that you haven't seen in years, which is using transparency, and I want to show you the data. So, okay, it's, it might be a little bit hard to see, but I hope, I hope you can make it out. So I'm going to kind of describe to you what you're looking at. On the y-axis is the boxing group's measure of growth limitation. So if a point lies above the y-axis, it's growth limiting. If it lies below the y-axis, it's not growth limiting. Now on the x-axis, I plotted the shadow prices of a metabolite. So each dot is one metabolite. And I'm basically just plotting a shadow price versus its measure of growth limitation for all the conditions and for all the metabolites which are relevant, basically, which haven't been filtered out because of noise or whatever. So what you can't see is that there are a lot of points which are all overlapping each other, which sit here. Most of the points which are not growth limiting, and there are many of them, they all sit here, but they just fall on top of each other. But the trend that you should see is that almost overwhelmingly, or it is overwhelmingly, it's almost exclusively that if you are not growth limiting, you have a zero shadow price. And if you are growth limiting, you have a negative shadow price, which increases the more negative you get based on the condition. So for glucose limitation, the more you move this way, the higher the red dots get. And it works better for the natural nutrient limitations than for the osotropes, but it holds. And no matter how you cut it, the correlation is very strong. Okay, so hopefully, maybe I'll leave it on. Hopefully, if, if you've done FBA, this might not surprise you because people have kind of thought that this is the case for a long time, but there just wasn't any data. But now there's data, and it's true, yeah. Okay, so. Hopefully you're still asking yourself, so what? Because I haven't said anything about dynamics. So now I want to... Sorry, can I ask you one question? Yeah. Um, how do you know that these metabolites are growth limiting versus growth limited? Oh, so you don't. Okay. Yeah, you don't. Okay. Yeah. There's actually, you know, I, I, I think that the better follow-up experiment is that... Um, so I think if they were growth limited, they might not actually go up in abundance, possibly. But I actually think that the better experiment is to repeat this, but do proteomics to actually kind of disentangle whether um, the outcome is really due, the, the increase in growth rate is due to more enzyme or more, more metabolite. Yeah, I mean, what you, or you might want to knock out a reaction that produces some of these metabolites to show yeah. you that they grow faster. Yeah, so that, that's actually what, what they did with the odds but yeah. the problem is that it really messes up the data and most of these trends, so they get very few uh, good linear fits. So a lot of the data is very non-linear and non-monotonic actually. If it was non-linear it would be okay, but it's also non-monotonic, so it's kind of, yeah, it's messy. Do you think it's messy because it's actually not a steady state? It's a hemostat. I know, but the cell growth is a steady state, but I guess... I think it's as close to steady state as you can devise That's in an experiment. Yeah. I guess the other concern is it got messy because it's just growth limited. As opposed to what? Growth limited. That oh, even oh, if you don't accumulate the metabolite, you still grow faster. You're just, it just you couldn't get more metabolite without growing faster. But you can grow faster without being more adaptive. So I see. Causality. So it's not causality. Yeah. That, that, that's all I'm yeah. sure getting at. No, no, I, I agree yeah. with you. I agree with yeah. you. But then, I guess, what about the possibility that there are a bunch of cells that's growing and there are a bunch of cells that's dying, so that the OD stays the same? But that is the case. Yeah. yeah. So there is definitely turnover, and in fact, these cells are going through the cell cycle and whatever. But I think it's, it's a subtle thing, but actually, in FBA. Even though you're modeling a single cell, the data that you're comparing it to is really a, an average over a whole population of cells. And you would hope that 
I don't know that it's really true, but you'd hope that a lot of those effects average out. And I don't think that they actually do, but there's no way to assess it right now. I think your point is that they're at least growth correlated. Yeah, no, they're part. definitely growth correlated. But the yeah. fact that, that they also correlate very well with shadow prices, which you would expect to give you a measure of limitation, suggests that. So there, there are other metabolites which correlate with growth, which they filtered out for some reason because they, they weren't convinced that they were truly growth limiting. And if you add those metabolites to this plot, you still see a very significant correlation, but it's actually a lot weaker. Well, do shadow prices necessarily, are, are shadow prices um, uh, causative in the sense that are shadow prices actually growth limitations, or is it also growth correlative? Because it's just a No, growth, growth limitation. It's yeah. definitely growth limitation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, now I want to do something maybe a little, I would say a little more on the fringe. <laughs> So what I want to do is I want to interpret growth limitation in a more kinetic way. The way I want to do it is I want you to engage with me in something called a Gedanken experiment, which is just you think. And in this thinking experiment, we're going to consider a very simple metabolic network with two metabolites. And these metabolites are red and blue. And there's an inflow to these metabolites from somewhere, and then they combine to form, uh, to form biomass. So I'm going to make some assumptions on the rate at which this biomass reaction proceeds, and the assumptions are basically that biomass is very sensitive to the amount of this red metabolite, which we'll call A, so dBBDA, if BB is the biomass reaction, is much larger than zero. If you call this metabolite B, then dBB, dB, it's approximately zero. So what I'm kind of assuming here is that A is growth limiting for BB and B is not. And the game I want to play is I want to understand how this growth limitation affects linearized dynamics around a steady state. And if you do dynamics, then you probably have a lot of intuition for what's going to happen. But if you don't, I'll draw it out for you. So the experiment is the following. This system is chilling out at steady state, and then you walk up with a needle and you inject a little bit of red or blue metabolite into the system. So if you inject a little bit of red, imagine that this is concentration versus time. Okay, so what happens? You inject a little bit of red, and as soon as you inject red instantaneously, the rate of this reaction increases a lot, right? Because by definition, it's very sensitive to the amount of red. So, because it increases, it pulls red back to steady state. And at the same time, the abundance of blue goes down. Actually, it doesn't go down instantaneously. It kind of goes like this. Because the, re the rate of this reaction has gone up. And then it returns to steady state at some characteristic time. And I'm not going to convince you of it right now, but this characteristic time to return to steady state is much longer than the characteristic time to, for red to return to steady state. And the way to see that is to do the opposite experiment, where you inject a bunch of B. So if you inject a bunch of B, well, what happens? All of a sudden, B goes up, but the rate of BB does not go up at all, right? So actually, it takes much longer for B to return to steady state because this reaction is just not sensitive to it. There's no there's no feedback from the reaction to make B get back to stay state faster. And similarly, actually, A is the, the reaction of A is just a blip, right? It, it's very small, and it just returns to steady state. Now, the kind of toy model that I showed you here um, might not convince you of this fact that the return to steady state is different for A and B, but it's not. The outcome is not a function of the model that I'm showing you. It's actually just a function of the qual uh, yeah, I would say the quality of linearized dynamics around the steady state. So the, the point I'm trying to make with all these fancy words I'm using is just that it takes A much less time to get back to steady state than it takes for B to get back to steady state. So the point is that if you're growth limiting, then you have a short, let's say, I'm going to call it transient time. So a short time to return to steady state. 
Whereas, if you're not growth limiting, you have a characteristically longer transient time. Okay. So, this is my interpretation of growth limitation for you. I hope you like it. Um, so, now, hopefully you see where I'm going with this, which is that shadow prices, based on that plot, tell you something about growth limitation. Right? So, if the shadow price is zero, this means that metabolite is growth limiting, and that it should have a short return to steady state, very quick return, so short transient time. Okay. Whereas, if the shadow price is zero, it's not growth limiting, and it should have a longer return to steady state, a longer transient time. Okay, so now I want to bring you back to the reality, which is FBA, which is that these shadow prices are derived from a steady state model of metabolism, right? So these shadow prices are exactly the quantities which complement the primal variables in FBA, and they just tell you about growth limitations of metabolites, and I'm trying to interpret them as gross measures of some dynamic quantity. So this is really dangerous because the reason that you do FBA is because you really don't know anything about <coughs> metabolite dynamics. So could it really be the case that the calculations that you do in FBA tell you something dynamic? So again, the only way I can convince you of this, and I think the answer is yes, is to show you data and compare that data to my own predictions. So that's what I'm going to do. And the data I'm going to use is from another lab at Princeton. It's Josh Rabinowitz's lab. Uh, it's from two papers from 2009, 2012. And the data, actually the experiments are just really amazing. So he basically grows E. coli on some filters in a particular kind of media. So a really simple example is he grows them in nitrogen-limited conditions. And then because he's growing them on a filter, he can instantaneously move them to brand new media conditions that are totally different. So he can move them from nitrogen scarce to nitrogen-rich media. So he does this. This is concentration versus time. He does this for his cells. And then as soon as he moves them, he starts monitoring the time-dependent responses of the concentrations of metabolites to this perturbation. So he finds that some metabolites grow up, some metabolites go down, some fluctuate, whatever. And he takes about 10 time points, spanning 15 minutes. He takes a time point after a few seconds, and after 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. He has about 10 data points. And that's his data. So, I happened upon this data, and I thought, oh, you know, this is this is really nice because it's it's really hard to do this experiment. There are not many experiments like this, and you can extract some dynamical information from this data that might be useful in interpreting shadow prices kinetically. So the thing which I did, which I want to spend a little bit of time on, is I tried to infer the the transient time, the time it takes for these concentrations to return to steady state. But it's really hard because the time series is really sparse. If you look at time series analysis, the 10 data points, you basically cannot do anything. You can't really smooth the data with 10 data points. So rather than using transient times, I used as a proxy for transient times the coefficient of variation of the time series, which is basically the standard deviation over the mean. Now, there are some big caveats about this. The first one is that the units of transient time are not the same as the units of coefficient of variation. But you cannot get transient times from this because, I mean, these are actually kind of realistic mock-ups of what some of the profiles look like, and there is no return to steady state for a lot of these profiles. So if you want to extract dynamic information, you have to do something, and this is why I elected to do. So this is a very crude proxy, but qualitatively it might make sense that if you exhibit a long transient time, then you have a larger coefficient variation, 
because you're kind of fluctuating more. And if you have a short transient time, then you should have a smaller coefficient of variation. So what I did is I took these data sets. For each metabolite, I, ca I calculated the coefficient of variation. And I similarly replicated the experiments in FBA and plotted the shadow presses, and I plotted them against each other. So this is transparency two. So, okay. So there are five experiments, but I want to show you four. The fifth one is not as clean, I'll be honest with you. It's still significant, but not as clean. So I want to give you some bearings for what you're looking at here. These are 2D histograms, which people have told me are totally not intuitive, but they will be in a second. So <laughs> on one axis, I'm plotting the shadow price of a metabolite. On the other axis, I'm plotting temporal variation. And the height of a bar is how many metabolites fall in that little grid, in that little space on a grid. And the reason I did this is because a lot of metabolites tend to have the same shadow price and they fall on top of each other. And you really can't see the data unless you plot a histogram. And I've colored these, these grids for you in a very particular way. So the boundaries between the grids are the average temporal variation and the average shadow price. And what I'm predicting, bless you, is that uh, metabolites which have a very negative shadow price should have very low temporal variation. And metabolites which have very high temporal variation should have a very low shadow price. So basically, points which fall in the blue are quote unquote good, and points which fall in the red are bad. So what I'm, what I'm hoping for is that metabolites which are growth limiting, which have a very negative shadow price, tend to fall in the blue regions, not the red regions. Now, it's very hard to do statistical analysis on this, so I decided to do it two ways. One is just a spearman correlation. And you do find that the more negative a shadow price gets, the lower its temporal variation gets. And you can also permute this data to see how many times at random, if you just shuffle the shadow prices and the temporal variations, will you get this many points in the red region. And in both cases, you find that this is a very non-random assortment of shadow prices and temporal variations. In particular, it really seems like there's a very strong statistical signal that metabolites which are growth limiting, which have a very negative shadow price, actually have very low temporal variation. So this, this particular plot, is extremely controversial. And people have given me a very hard time about believing it for good reason. Because I'm trying to interpret quantities from a steady state model in a dynamic manner. OK, so I'm going to leave that data up for you to ponder. But I want to kind of close um, by addressing what I feel is, at least you know, if I were a reviewer of this paper, what I would ask. And the, the thing I would ask is, are you serious? Um, and in particular, I would ask, are you really telling me that the dynamics of metabolites are captured by growth limitation and they don't uh, depend on the detailed kinetics of the reaction? So, I mean, all of these metabolites are, are in this very high dimensional, complicated dynamical system. Uh, and it's surprising that you can just use growth limitation to characterize their gross dynamics. So am I really telling you that growth limitation is all you need to know to figure out how a metabolite varies in time? And my answer is no. I'm not saying that. So what am I saying? Well, the way I view the problem is that, I mean, FBA tells you how to distribute resources in the best way. And when you do this, you inherently, you must encounter certain limitations in distributing your resources. And these limitations are key intracellular metabolites, which you find to be growth limiting. Now, the way I interpret these growth limiting metabolites is that if you allow them to fluctuate, this messes with your growth rate a lot. Your growth rate depends very, very sensitively on how much of this metabolite is around. And if you just let it go all willy-nilly, well, then it will mess with your growth rate. And the way to, to get around this problem is to control those metabolites somehow. And there are two ways you can control. So one way, I think, is growth limitation. But the more obvious way is through a real controller. Controller. So what do I mean 
company by a controller? Well, it's well known that metabolites provide feedback to enzymes, for example, by allosterically inhibiting them. So this is what biochemists have been studying for a really long time. To select for some controlling mechanisms in your metabolic network, they should control these metabolites. So that's a real hypothesis, which is really testable. And I want to close by showing you some preliminary data which tests it. So this is work with Emma Breyers, who's an undergrad in our lab. And what we did is we reconstructed a small molecule <coughs> regulatory network in E. coli. So what I mean by this is that we reconstructed the network of all meta like metabolites and enzyme interactions which are not uh, metabolic in nature. For example, any competitive inhibitory reactions, any allosteric in inhibitory or activating reactions. And we have a whole network in E. coli. So there's about, I would say, 500 unique edges. And these edges basically tell you which metabolites are inhibiting or activating which reactions. And this activation is not the same as being a substrate. It's literally increasing the rate of a reaction. OK, so where am I going with this? Well, my proposition is that Metabolites, which tend to be growth limiting in many kinds of conditions, like cofactors, like ATP, might tend to have a lot of edges in this network. They might provide a lot of feedback, which stabilizes them. So that's something you can really test. So I'm just going to plot something for you here. So I'm going to plot the number of reactions a metabolite regulates versus it's temporal variation in one of these experiments. So they all kind of look the same when you plot it like this. I didn't want to make the same, the same plot four times. So I'm just going to draw for you. What you find is really awesome. So you find that metabolites, which have a lot of regulatory edges, they show very little temporal variation. And similarly, the metabolites, which have lots of temporal variation, tend to have very few regulatory edges. So things tend to fall underneath this curve. And what this suggests to me is that there has actually been some evolutionary selection for having regulatory edges from commonly growth inhibiting or growth limiting metabolites like ATP, which is the most regulatory metabolite in the cell, that controls the temporal variation of these metabolites to a variety of perturbations so that growth rate is robust to fluctuations. So like I said, this preliminary work, but I think that if you see a plot like this, and you see it four times for four different experiments, provide some pretty compelling evidence. So that's where I'll leave it. Um, and that's the end of my talk. And I just want to thank the people who, who helped me uh, do the research. And the way I want to do it is a little bit different. So uh, for those of you who know me, you know that I'm a contrarian to the bone. I, I say no to everybody. And in fact, there was a period of my life when at lab meetings, when someone said something, I would constantly ask them to prove it to me. And it was an unreasonable question. And I kind of grew out of it. But I think it characterizes who I really am. So uh, for a few people, I, I kind of want to highlight how they've said no to me over the years and how that's influenced uh, my research. So. Uh, I want to thank my lab mates, um, who I've had many useful conversations with, um, and in particular the people who I collaborated with, who are uh, Sarah Collins and Emma Breyers, and also the people outside of the lab who I worked with, um, like Osman Chowdhury, who's in the math department, and Alex Watson, who's at Columbia. Um, and I want to thank my committee. So each person on my committee I've had some sort of very useful conversation with, actually. I was just thinking yesterday that uh, James was on my qualifier committee, and he asked me a question about FBA, and I responded, and he told me I was wrong, and I told him I was wrong, and then he asked me to prove it, and then I was wrong. Uh, and <laughs> I, I think it, it, yeah, it says a lot about how much I tell you about things, but also about how I learn, because uh, it forces me. When you tell me I'm wrong, it really, I, I try to, to prove I'm right, and that's how I come upon how I'm wrong. <laughs> 
Um, so the, the person who I want to highlight on my committee, besides James, was uh, Tasso. So um, Tasso is a very busy person, and a few years ago I was uh, working on a project, and I had heard, like, Tasso is great, you know, you should ask him if he needs some guidance. So I emailed Tasso and I said, can you give me just 15 minutes of your time um, to just, like, point me towards a book or, you know, the right direction? And um, I sent him, like, a little bit of the work I had done, and when I showed up at his office, he had read everything I had sent to him, and he spent an hour with me, and then he told me to come back. And uh, he basically asked me to come back over and over and over again, and ended up advising me on this project, and I mean, he, you know, he's the chair of the math department, and he's super busy, and he always made time for me. He never said no to me. And I think as a result, I learned a lot of really useful things, in particular that I should always check my calculations because they're always wrong. Um, and uh, someone else who is not on my committee who I want to thank is Punkage uh, Meta, who... So Punkage is kind of the opposite of Tasso. Punkage always told me I was wrong, uh, and it was great because... Um, you know, we he basically get into these yelling matches, and he made me feel really like a gunslinger because he forced me to defend my ideas. And he was he was really like the driving force behind the shadow price uh, idea that forced me to come up with a cogent, coherent reason why you saw the correlations that you did. And without him, I don't think I would have gone nearly as far. 